Good morning. Happy Father's Day and welcome to worship at Moorhead Church. We're located in physical space at 3214 Horse Pen Creek Road in Greensboro, but we're also located for wherever you are, for the church is not a building. The church is a people. We're very grateful that you're here for worship. My name is Veronita Alvord and I get to be the pastor here. I missed you last week as our family was on vacation at the beach and we had a glorious time. And I'm reminded that today is actually the first day of summer. So happy summer, happy Sunday, happy Father's Day, happy Juneteenth Day, and happy day. We're so grateful to be able to worship the Lord this day and raise our voices and make a joyful noise. I would remind you that we have a drive through ice cream social from 4.30 to 5.30 this afternoon. If you need a little adventure this afternoon, I'd invite you to come by the church at 3214 Horsepen Creek Road for a little selection of ice cream and a wonderful greeting and some hospitality as the day unfolds. Once again, happy Father's Day. Today we consider what it means to walk in someone else's footsteps, to imitate them and to follow them. Most especially, what does it mean for us to imitate Jesus, whom we call Savior, Messiah, and friend? Once again, welcome to Moorhead Church.
We give God great thanks for the opportunity we have to remember that God uses broken things. God uses misfits and prodigals and rebels. God uses imperfect people to do justice and to have mercy and to walk humbly with God. I'm reminded and ever aware that God uses someone like me, or I pray that God uses someone like me, imperfect, incomplete, and sometimes immature. And I'm so grateful for the privilege of calling myself a child of God. As we consider who our fathers are and how we imitate their good qualities and strive not to follow with their bad qualities, I would invite you to open your hands and take a deep breath and join your heart with mine as we pray. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious God, we are grateful for the chance to sing your praises, for the chance to play your drums and strum your guitars, for the chance to use the instruments of our voices to proclaim your praise. For indeed, today is the day that you have made, and we are rejoicing, and we are so glad in it. This day, holy God, we are reminded of your challenge to us to walk in the footsteps of the one who came to save us and set us free. The one who met mis misfits and told stories of rebels and lost children. The one who reached out to people whom no one else would touch. And we are challenged through your love in the name of the Christ to follow in his footsteps. This means doing uncomfortable things, holy God. This means speaking out when we feel afraid. This means changing our habits and perhaps doing things for the sake of people we do not even know, but because we respect them and their lives, we might change our behavior. God, I thank you for the passing seasons and for the opportunity to remember the beach which you have made, the sand and the sun, and relationships which deepen and ripen over time. God, thank you for the way you have formed your earth and the way your earth forms us as we observe its changing and its growth. God, thank you for the remembrance of Juneteenth, for the opportunity we have to remember the word that sets people free. Remind us that your word sets us free. So open our ears and wipe the sleep from our eyes so that we might be attuned to what you might say to us this day, and it is in your holy name I pray, and everyone said, Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Romans. We're in a series considering letters of commission, how we are commissioned through the Apostle Paul, in Jesus' name, to go about our lives as Christians. We're in Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 11. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in sin? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with Christ. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death can no longer have dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Once again, holy God, I entreat you to use the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, and may it be pleasing to you, for we long to please you. You are our rock, our redeemer, our savior, Messiah, our friend, you are the Father of lights, the Father we have in heaven, who gives us our primary identity. So God, be with us. Breathe in us and light us up. Change us and teach us. For we long to open ourselves to your holy word, which sets us free. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, Joe and I went to Greece on our honeymoon, and one of the most interesting things that Joe uh, was excited about is that we were headed to the island of Mykonos, and he thought we could explore the 365 chapels on the island of Mykonos in the four days that we were present. I'll tell you, we only made it to two chapels in that period of time. We spent a lot of time in the country of Greece. We were able to stay in Athens, and then we were headed north in the country of Greece, and we stopped off at a place called Meteora. Meteora is named for meteors that were thought to land in the parts of northern Greece, leaving these huge mountainous outcroppings. On top of these outcroppings, like pin cushions on top of giant sticks, there were small monasteries and sanctuaries built back in the four and five hundreds. The only people who went out to Meteora at the time were priests and monks who longed to take harbor in God and who thought that if they could climb those huge outcroppings and make sanctuary there, that they'd be closer to God because they were certainly closer to heaven. Inside some of those uh, monasteries are beautiful paintings on cave walls and even on ceilings in which only a person can see the painting if they are lying down. That's the only way to see the painting. It was an amazing, amazing experience to go there. We were actually on our way to Thessaloniki, and Thessaloniki is the location of two of Paul's letters. There was a small Christian community in Thessaloniki, and Paul had great affection for them. That's why he wrote them two letters instead of one. He writes to them with deep affection, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of the persecution you received, the word with joy, you were inspired by the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. We always give thanks to God for all of you, and we mention you in our prayers, and we constantly remember you before God the Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfast hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
with that in mind. We were encountering all these roadside parks along the way to Thessaloniki. There were lots of cars and people parked on one side of the road and walked to the other side of the road. And we wondered, where are these people going? And we said, the next time we see a crowd cross the road and go down some trail into something we couldn't see, we said to each other, let's stop the next time we see a crowd. So we did. We stopped and we pulled in like everybody else and we actually went under the road and we found ourselves in a huge cave that was actually a Greek Orthodox church. And we stumbled upon a Greek Orthodox baptism. It was the baptism of a tiny baby. That baby was presented, even though we couldn't speak Greek, we realized what was happening. That baby was presented to the priest in darkly covered clothes. And he was wearing navy blue, actually. And as he was getting ready to pre be presented, his mother and his grandmother undressed him to the point that he was naked as the day he was born, and he started to wail. And as he wailed, the Greek Orthodox priest with this long gray beard took that baby and put oil all over that baby's body. And there was a huge baptismal. It looked like almost a, a, a kind of a swimming pool on a stand. It was giant. It was very deep. And as the priest was muttering words, as he was anointing this baby, getting ready for baptism, he lifted the child up and then he dunked the child into the baptismal font. And then he lifted the child up again and dunked the child a second time. And then, of course, he lifted the child up and dunked the child a third time in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And you would have thought that child was as greasy as a pig. It's a wonder that that Greek Orthodox priest was able to hang on to that baby. And as the baby was wailing and his whole body was turning red, he was handed back over to his mother and to his grandmother, and he was dressed in a radiant white baptismal gown. By that point, people had realized that probably we weren't Greek because we didn't know any of the words for worship and we went outside just, you know, backing away out of the worship space, hoping that we hadn't caused a riot by our presence there. When we saw that baby baptized, clearly in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, I realized that baptism means so much. It actually means more than being washed clean of our sin. When he was dipped three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, it was the three times that clicked in my mind. Because you see, on the third day, what happened? On the third day, Jesus was raised from the dead. On the third day, we celebrate a resurrection. And on the third day, we believe that is the Lord's day. And that's why we celebrate worship on a Sunday, on Resurrection Day. Jesus was raised on the third day. And baptism is based on an ancient Jewish ritual called the mikvah. The mikvah. Typically, the mikvah is used by women when they're on their periods. It also was used by men and women who lived in the village of Qumran near the Dead Sea. Now, Qumran is a village that's been excavated in Israel-Palestine, and there's a whole series of mikvah pools, of cleansing pools. You see, Qumran is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are the earliest dated versions of scripture that we have. We might think that cleanliness is next to godliness, but that's actually not scriptural. I hope I'm not breaking anybody's um, idea about that. It's not scriptural. However, it is religious and cultural since our roots are Jewish. Early in Christian worship, Christian worship began in Jewish communities 
and the mikvah began to morph into a baptism ritual around the 500s or 600s. And the mikvah morphed into baptism, particularly baptism on Easter and Pentecost Sundays. Catechumenates, those who were seeking baptism, were actually forbidden to say the Lord's Prayer in worship until they were baptized. In fact, if you were seeking baptism and you were attending worship, you'd be asked to leave worship before the Lord's Prayer was said. But on the day you were baptized, either on Easter Sunday or Pentecost Sunday, you were asked to dress in darkly colored clothes. And at the appropriate time, you were lined up before the baptismal pool and you were actually asked to shed your clothes. And in the name of the Trinity, three times, you were baptized in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Holy Spirit, you were baptized not only into the life of Christ, you were baptized into his death also. For what is being drowned in a ritual setting other than a symbol of death? And that we die three times and we're raised three times. After baptism, those early Christians were dressed in radiant white. And that radiant white indicated a new life, a resurrection in the name of Jesus the Christ. Paul states in this part of Romans that we Christians are not only baptized into his life, we're baptized into his death. Now, what's that mean exactly? I don't mean to be a little, um, well, I do mean to be a little funny, but here is what I mean. Since it's Father's Day, what this means is, who's your daddy? <laughs> Who is your daddy? I asked Joe yesterday, what if I started the sermon today by saying, who's your daddy? He said, it's not, an idea, not a good idea. But here it is in the middle. So the question really gets at our identity, our identity. To whom do we really belong as Christians? Though your identity on your driver's license may indicate you are part of the state of North Carolina, though your birth certificate may record your father's name in the blank that says father, your primary identity is in God in heaven who formed you and who made you. For Paul, baptism is who we are in Christ. Just as Christ was raised on the third day, will never die again. We are raised from baptismal waters and we cannot fall back into our love of sin. That's what David Bartlett writes in his commentary to the Romans. Ernst Kasemann, a famous a German theologian writes in his commentary on, on Romans, the cross is actualized in the act of baptism. In other words, when we're baptized, our lives take on a cross-like form. We have within our bodies the vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship with our neighbor, all doused in the sacrifice of Jesus for love's sake. Now, that means we are imitators of Christ. Just as the Thessalonians were complimented by Paul, we imitate Christ. We follow in his footsteps. And isn't that what we want to do as children with our earthly fathers who set for us a good example? We want to follow in their footsteps. And we want to avoid the places where we've seen our fathers fall or falter or maybe even fail. We lose our lives for the sake of Christ in order to find our lives. We give our lives away in order to receive our lives, grace upon grace. We get lost in acts of service and love so that we might get found. 
we get loved and embraced uh, by the one to whom we return. And when uh, the praise band sang about the prodigal and that God needs broken people in order to do God's work in the world, remember how the prodigal wished his dad was dead and asked for his inheritance, then went off and lost his inheritance in quick order. And then when he came home expecting the life of a servant, the father welcomed him with open arms and not even just welcomed him, but said, get the ring, get sandals for his feet and a new robe and kill the fatted calf. That is who our daddy is. The one who welcomes us home no matter what. The father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And once baptized, we don't need to worry about the fact that Adam followed the path of obedient, disobedience. We only need to say and act and believe on the fact that we belong to Christ. We no longer belong to Adam's people. We belong to Christ. And so we work in faith, we labor with hope, and we labor with love. Christ followed the path of obedience toward life. It is Christ in whom we live. He is the one who's fully present and fully obedient to God, and we are the people of God. We are not Adam's people anymore. This is like a new citizenship card. This must be what the DACA recipients felt when they heard this past week the Supreme Court's ruling upholding their place in our country. They could take a deep breath when they heard the news and they could begin to dream again. I heard an activist on behalf of the dreamers say, today we celebrate, tomorrow we continue to work for justice. How true. This new citizenship card, this sense of freedom must be what our African-American brothers and sisters feel when they celebrate Juneteenth. June 19th in 1865, you may have heard, the remaining slaves in Galveston, Texas, were told by a Union Army general named Gordon Granger that they were free. What's Juneteenth celebration look like? Well, it usually begins with a reading of the Emancipation Proclamation, every word. Sometimes it begins with a reading of the 13th Amendment. Neither slavery nor volunteer, voluntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And after the reading of some of our founding documents in our country, there is a feast. The feast not only indicates a freedom from slavery, but a freedom for justice. It indicates a freedom to do justice, a freedom to work for peace, a freedom which as Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative said in his commencement address to the College of the Holy Cross. By the way, Brian Stevenson wrote a book called Just Mercy. It came out in 2014, and there's a movie by the same name that's out now. And I would commend it to you as an example of what it means to seek justice and walk humbly with God. Brian Stevenson said to these graduates of Holy Cross, when you create the kind of identity where you represent hope and mercy and justice and commitment and love and dedication to the people around you, you can say things to them that will allow the world to change. Your identity will open up a world that allows you to do things that no one else thought was possible. It will allow you to believe in things that you have not seen. Then he tells these graduates, you can't change the world. And I hate to say this to you on such a glorious day, but you cannot change the world 
unless you sometimes do things that are uncomfortable, I want to ask you to consider doing uncomfortable things in the service of justice. Uncomfortable things that lift up the poor. Uncomfortable things that lift up the marginalized. Uncomfortable things that confront poverty, bias, and discrimination. It's only when we do the uncomfortable things that we actually begin to understand the power that this degree, this education, opens up for us. The power we all possess to change the world. What power do we as Christians have? Christians have the power. We possess the power to change the world. And it doesn't come from us. It comes from the God who made us, the Father of lights. It comes from Christ who lives in us and in whom and through whom we are all resurrected, alive to God, to work for justice, to labor with love and mercy, and to act with steadfast hope. May it indeed be true. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, I give you great thanks for the chance we have to be reminded of our primary identity, that our identity is not on our birth certificate, it's not on our driver's license, our identity is written on our hearts. For indeed, you have formed us and you have made us. We are baptized in the name of Jesus the Christ, which makes our lives imitations of his. Not in any kind of fake way, but in a way that forms our footsteps, that molds our lives towards mercy and justice and humility as we strive to walk in your way, which is the way that leads to life. We strive to walk in your way through corporate worship, through personal devotion, through acts of justice, and through acts of mercy. God, remind us that our lives take the shape and form of the cross when we do the uncomfortable things, when we take the risk on the part of the least, the lost, and the last. So give us the courage and strength we need to face today unafraid, tomorrow unafraid, and the days to come. For you made us who we are we are yours, and you are ours. Thanks be to you, holy God. Amen.
Can I get an amen? I'm so grateful to have the Moorhead Messengers here uh, with me as we do live streaming for worship. And I'm so glad that you are here. If you would open your hands and if you're with your family, grab the hand of somebody close to you and go now with this benediction. Go knowing that the God who created you and formed you is your father. Go knowing that we strive to walk in his son's footsteps day after day, knowing that Jesus the Christ will save us and set us free. Go with the gumption and audacity of Holy Spirit people to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly in the way that leads to life now and forever. Amen. Amen.